to get that vital piece of engagement um, can be you know, a very long and tiring task, but um, I'm sure we're going to find some excellent pearls of wisdom from the speakers, so I'll hand it over to Jack. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for being here. So while it may be the holy grail, uh, I'm a consultant uh, who advises many organizations and have done this kind of work in the US for many years, and my experience is there and also in the UK and Canada. And uh, while it may be the holy grail, when we think about the current state of engaging doctors in improvement, um, I'd like to think of it as almost, in the Bible's observation, is it's almost like islands of excellence. We have islands of engagement, but there's whole swaths of most organizations where many doctors remain unengaged. Um, and while it's, it's, it's obvious to say, it's, I think it's important to underscore that any efforts to improve that don't really engage doctors are bound to be less than what's needed to get the level of improvement that's required. So I want to just start the session by pointing out what I would describe as five common barriers to engagement uh, for doctors in improvement. And uh, then we're going to hear a story of an organization that really, I think, has addressed these in their own way. And then I want to come back at the end and talk about the general truths that perhaps will help you think about if you have issues in engaging doctors in your organization, how to go about it. But for, to start off with these barriers, one, there is no organization-wide method for improvement. We have different parts of the organization using different methodologies. And while I think, frankly, I don't favor one over another, it's important to have one so that we can communicate across the silos of the organization and really reap the benefits of what we're learning. Secondly, um, this whole issue of urgency, and too few doctors really think of this as urgent, more like it's selective, it might be a good idea, but not urgent. Um, and one of the things we know from the literature is when people don't think something's urgent, they have other things to do with their time. Thirdly, um, I think many doctors find that uh, in their organizations there's constant requests for change, but there's no common picture of what we're trying to accomplish collectively. If we look out three or five years, what's the picture, if you will, of the promised land? There isn't one, and so it's just bombarded with constant change. Fourth, I think the doctor leader, uh, when they're leading their colleagues, is in a very difficult position because they're not empowered typically by their colleagues to lead or implement change. They don't really speak for their colleagues, and so it's very difficult for them to have a lot of influence in the organization with senior leaders because unlike other senior managers in the organization, they really find it very difficult to promise what they will be able to execute given their relationship with their own colleagues. And finally, five, I think many doctors view the very essence of improvement, if we think about standardization as one of the really important uh, themes of improvement, they find that as inconsistent with what they would describe often as professionalism and the deal or their understanding of what it meant to be a professional, what they signed up for, because often this idea of I take all the responsibility and for that I have clinical autonomy, that's something which we I think still need to face and it is one of the barriers. So I want to turn it over now to Gary Kaplan who's going to share with you a story in his organization um, that I think very much addresses these barriers. Barriers, and then we'll come back and talk about the general principles. Thanks, Jack. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to uh, share this week with all of you and, and the opportunity to learn together. Uh, as Jack tells us, there's many barriers that we encounter as we attempt to engage physicians. And we at Virginia Mason have worked hard over the last decade. Uh, to overcome these barriers and hopefully make some progress. So what I'm going to do is, in a very short period of time is tell you a bit about our journey over the last 10 years. And then we'll, Jack will come back and help us connect some of those dots. Uh, but just a, a few words about who we are. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Virginia Mason, we're a single hospital, not a multi-hospital uh, delivery system in the Seattle uh, area, in the Pacific Northwest, the uh, Northwest corner of the United States. We started as one of those few clinics that were formed in the Mayo Clinic model. And our founders came from Mayo 92 years ago uh, to start the uh, Virginia Mason. Today, we're in nine locations. We have uh, 500 employed physicians, but we also are the hospital of choice for Group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound, which is a large uh, HMO in the Pacific Northwest. We have an academic mission in addition to our patient care mission. And we have 120 of our own uh, medical and surgical residents. We have a research institute. And uh, just recently, we formed the Virginia Mason Institute to help us educate uh, people from other areas of the United States and around the country in some of our methods. 
So I became the seventh CEO in 92 years. There have only been seven of us in the year 2000. And shortly thereafter, it became very clear that we needed to change. We needed to find a new management system, and we went looking. We looked in many of the leading institutions in the United States, and we didn't feel that we had identified a management system that would work for us. And then we heard from Boeing, the Boeing airplane manufacturing company, about the great work they'd been doing applying the principles of the Toyota production system to airplane manufacturing, making an airplane faster, better, and at much lower cost. We began to explore this, these principles, and today many organizations around the world are using lean principles, but at that time no one was. And we began to explore the opportunity, and at the suggestion of uh, Boeing, after a period of learning, we went to Japan. We took our entire senior executive team to Japan. We said, if you want to be a senior leader at Virginia Mason, you have to come. And I had no idea what I would find there, because I had never been to Japan. But we learned and came home different. And this June, I'll be leading our 13th team of physicians, nurses, uh, managers, and frontline staff as we work in the factories and learn how to bring those principles back to healthcare. We came home from that journey and said, you know, we are in a very special industry. We take care of people at their most vulnerable moments in their lives. But at the end of the day, as we think about our work, we've learned to think now that we make things. We make office visits, we make surgical procedures, we make inpatient stays. And if you think of it that way, it forces you to think about the processes that go into making things. We also realized that we dealt with life and death, but if an airplane fall out, fell, falls out of the sky, that's life or death. Or if an automobile fails going down the freeway, that's life or death. And so we said, we have much to learn here. And we came home and said, this will be our management system. Now we said our goal was to be the quality leader, but we needed to really understand what we meant by quality. And so we thought outcomes. We all talk about outcomes, clinical outcomes, functional outcomes. We also talked about the patient experience, service. We had traditionally thought of the denominator in the equation as cost. But we realized that if we just worry about taking out costs, that will often be a way to reduce quality. And we began to learn that by taking out waste, the things that add no value, we can actually improve quality and lower cost. And then finally, we came to see that appropriateness was critical. And in so many ways, this is the crucial part of this equation. We can do great procedures with great outcomes and great service and efficiently with no waste, but if the patient doesn't need them to begin with, there's no quality there. So we got very clear 10 years ago about our work. We said this is our management system and we will ask every single one of our 5,000 staff members to be trained to be trained in the principles. And these are the principles, and I won't go into them in great detail, but value stream mapping, understanding our work at a deep, granular level. Every area in our medical center has value stream maps, current state and future state. What is it the work today? And it's very surprising when we come to understand how much waste there is in our processes. And what is our future state that we aspire to? Rapid process improvement workshops, the short rapid cycle events, one day, two day, or more traditionally four or five day workshops to redesign our work. How do we organize our workplace, 5S? How do we build new facilities w only when necessary, 3P? And how do we embed standard work into our daily work life? And just to show you that no one, no process, no area in our health system is immune from the opportunity. In fact, no area can opt out of this work. These are just examples of clinical and non-clinical areas where this work has been applied. I'm a primary care internal medicine physician. I still see primary care patients, not as many as I used to. Um, and we came to see that primary care was full of waste. In primary care, I would spend days just trying to catch up 
We would have to run faster and spend less and less time with our patients. By asking our primary care teams to redesign their work using these tools, today we have our primary care physicians seeing actually more patients, having more time with each individual patient, and getting home to have dinner with their families by taking the waste out of processes. In the inpatient world, the nurses were very, very um, demoralized because they were spending less than 40% of their time with the patient at the bedside. The nurses had become uh, expert hunters and gatherers. They would look, they spent so much time looking for things and walking up and down the halls and very little time at the bedside. By redesigning patient flow and, pa and the nursing flows, nurses are now spending 90% of time with their patients. The emergency department, an area with diverts, meaning an ambulance comes up to a hospital and sees basically, essentially, a closed sign that we are not open for business because we do not have capacity to see you. By using these principles, we've been able to take our diverts almost to zero. Perhaps one of the most profound things we saw on that very first trip to Toyota and on every trip since was th this, their famous stopping the line program. Here we are at the Prius assembly line where every 58 seconds a new car is driven off the line and every 58 seconds a car enters the workstation and this worker does whatever it is his job is. If he can't do it, he pulls that cord and the line slows down. And if he still can't do it, he pulls this cord and the line stops. This was amazing for us to see, that 350 workers in a factory making 1,000 cars, every one of those workers was empowered to stop the assembly line. Think about that in our hospitals today. If every worker could stop the line, our team, when we first talked about this, said we'd have to go out of business because we would be stopping the line every minute of every day. But we came home and we said, we want this for our patients. We want to treat our patients every bit as good as Toyota treats their automobiles. And so we said, we as leaders will commit 24 hours a day, seven days a week to respond immediately, just as the supervisors do at Toyota when that cord is pulled. Dramatic change in our culture. In fact, this is actually old data, but as of the end of September of 2011, we had over 22,000 patient safety alerts called by frontline staff members. This is my work as leader. It's not work that I delegate. And in fact, every Tuesday morning, we lead stand-up, I lead stand-up, where we meet with the leaders of this improvement work. They report to me on their progress in 30 minutes or less, and then we have some teachable moments. Very important and very aligning for the most senior level of leadership in an organization that is seeking to transform itself to be engaged. Our economics have improved dramatically, as you can see. And what I'm most proud of is this line that we call our shared success threshold. This is the point at which we begin to share the economic benefit with our, all of our staff so that everyone feels that they have economic opportunity by contributing to the success of the organization. We were thrilled when in the year 2010, LeapFrog, which represents large employers in the United States, named Virginia Mason the top hospital uh, of the decade. Now, what was most exciting for us was that it was telling our staff they were working on the right work. And second, secondly, the fact that it was about quality and about resource stewardship. It wasn't about just quality and safety metrics, and it wasn't just about cost. It was about both. And that's demonstrating what truly is possible. So the real question for this session is how have we gotten there? In fact, I remember the day in October of 2000 when it was very clear to a, new, to, to a new CEO that if we didn't change, we were not going to survive as an organization. We weren't on death's doorstep, but the trajectory was not good. 
And I said, we change or we die. And then we were actually already three years into this journey when Mary McClinton, a community leader, came to Virginia Mason for a tertiary procedure, but one that we do every week, and we failed her. She died of a preventable medical error. So three years into this journey, feeling some urgency, this was a catalyzing event that propelled us even faster and said, we need to accelerate our work. Early in this journey, our board said, what's your vision? What is our plan? And in fact, helped us understand. They asked us, who was our customer? Now, I wasn't even sure about the use of the word customer, but it was, who is our customer? And I said, like everybody said, it's our patients. And they said, that's not the case. If that were the case, things would not look the way they look. And as we worked together to, to create a shared vision, we really came to realize that patient-centeredness and patient at the top was something that we needed to aspire to, that we didn't yet deeply understand. It's something we're learning 12 years later truly about what it means. We said we want to be the quality leader and help transform healthcare, and we needed a management system. So we had urgency, we had a vision. We also said, you know, we need leaders, and the role of the leader has to change. And at Virginia Mason, we used to be elected leaders. We were elected by a vote of the doctors. You try to think about running a billion dollar company with 5,000 people by a political process. Now I know that in some of our countries, entire health systems are being run by political processes. But we said this isn't gonna work at Virginia Mason. Not only that, being a physician leader is a real job with clear expectations, with feedback, with training, and with succession planning. We said, Everyone has to change. It's not just the physicians, it's not just the managers, it's not just the staff. And by setting that tone across the entire organization, we said we need to engage at a much deeper level than we've ever engaged. We didn't need to say, we didn't want to say we need to go get buy-in because we were all in it together. And then finally, we said, what is the expectations? that we need to have of each other. And if we don't challenge the old assumptions, the old expectations, we're never gonna make the progress we need to make. And so some of you may know, and you'll hear more from Jack in a minute about the notion of compact, but as we looked at the deal, when I joined Virginia Mason, and the deal is still operative in healthcare organizations around the world, it was a very sweet deal for a, doc, a young doctor Entitlement, protection, and autonomy. I was entitled to patients. I was protected by my organization, my managers, my leaders, and I was autonomous. I was a professional. I could do whatever I wanted. And we realized that that deal needed to be changed. And so at Virginia Mason, early in our journey, we said, we need a new deal. And I asked frontline physicians to create a new compact. And that compact was one of the most powerful opportunities for engagement we've ever had. It was a 15-month process. And this is our compact, and what's on this page is not really that important to you. If you have compacts in your organizations, they need to reflect your organizations and your aspirations. But this was a reciprocal agreement. What does every physician have every right to expect from the organization? And what does the organization have every right to expect from its doctors? Without our compact, without our shared vision, without a sense of urgency, and without leaders truly leading, we would not have been able to make the progress we've made and hopefully continue that progress as we go forward. Thank you. So to draw, excuse me, so to draw some really uh, general principles as you think about your job when you go back home. And again, our thrust here is about engaging doctors in improvement. Well, I think 
A single method for improvement was very demonstrated by, by Dr. Kaplan's presentation. One method where we can communicate across the organization and learn collectively. Otherwise, we continue to operate even in improvement as silos. Secondly, this notion of increasing a sense of urgency for people to have to take action, and I'm going to talk for just a moment about what it means to turn up the heat, so to speak. Third, this idea of a shared vision. This is the notion of inspiring action with a clear picture of the future. And I think certainly you heard about Virginia Mason's picture of the future with a patient on the top, and I think it did inspire a tremendous amount of action there. Third, Gary talked about making the idea of a physician leader a real job, enhancing leadership, developing doctor leaders who can sponsor change, who are willing to say, I believe this is what we need to do, as opposed to say, I was in a meeting today and they say we need to do this. They would stand up and actually own the need for change. And then finally, this modernizing the compact, this deal of what does it mean to be a part of the organization where doctors and leaders sit down, frontline doctors and leaders sit down together and co-create a new sense of what they're going to give and get in order to be able to accelerate this improvement and achieve the vision that they all share. So just a moment on each of these to kind of just flesh it out a bit more. Starting off with increasing urgency. Well, many of you may be familiar with the name John Cotter, who is at least in the United States, the, the ex recognized expert in leading change and transformation in large complex organizations. And he says it this way, a whole book he devoted to this notion of creating urgency. When people have a true sense of urgency, they think that action on critical issues is needed now, not eventually, not when it easily fits into a schedule. And so I cannot tell you how many times I get invited into an organization to help and, you know, we go there and we try to interview people and understand what the issues are and then the next time we can actually get together to start the work is three or four months down the pike. And how urgent could it be to people in that organization? And what's the message to people on the front line about whether or not improvement is truly urgent? And I think we run, particularly when we're trying to engage doctors, I think there's a whole special issue around urgency because this notion of needing to improve, needing to improve quality, can make doctors very uncomfortable um, because after all, I mean, trained to always do their very best and achieve the highest levels of quality and now we're threatening that. And so this is a kind of change where we're asking people to give up autonomy uh, in, in a very meaningful way um, and where we're asking people to be open to working with different people in different different ways and perhaps feeling even incompetent at times. This has been referred to by Ron Heifetz and others as adaptive change. And the point that I think he makes here in this, in this graph is when you're dealing with this kind of, again, adaptive change, people don't go there unless there is a certain amount of heat. And if you look at those two lines that are running across uh, horizontally on the diagram there, those green lines, you'll notice the adaptive change in red. People are held in between this limit of tolerance where too much distress is too much to tolerate, and this threshold of learning, when you're below that threshold of learning, you're really not engaged at all, you're kind of asleep about it. Holding people in that productive range of distress is what's critical. But so often, I think, particularly physician leaders dealing with physicians, don't really feel it's okay for them to make their colleagues feel uncomfortable or to feel any pain at all. But in the absence of that discomfort, and again, within limits, but within the absence of discomfort, people don't engage at all with this particular kind of change. And so it is not about wholesale kind of turning on the fire hose, but it is about getting people sufficiently uncomfortable so they do engage. Secondly, this idea about sharing a vision. Well, I think if you, that very notion of sharing a vision, in my experience, is often a very challenging concept for doctors to really think is valuable because if they really think it's valuable, they have to give up a lot of their silo orientation and the value on autonomy is where are we going to go together? But in the absence of challenging the silo orientation and the value of autonomy, oftentimes I think the shared vision looks something like this. Everybody doing the very best they can, and in an organization, which is pretty typical of many, when you win and you think about what is the vision, maybe it's about getting out at a decent time at the end of the day, or somehow getting through the next budget year. But it's not something which is really going to bind us all together to aspire to something better and different around this issue of improvement. 
Because, to, because if we're really going to have a shared vision, these are some of the things that I think are really critical. First of all, I think doctors have to really appreciate just how interdependent they are for success clinically, uh, professionally, um, and economically as well. Uh, we are interdependent. No longer is it great doctors working hard is going to make for a great organization or even a successful career. And I think that requires a lot of thinking and a lot of dialogue to get doctors to own that. Because this, this sense of independent and hardworking doctors leading to success, I think is embedded, deeply embedded in a whole generation of doctors. We have to really have a process to develop a vision which is more than a superficial paper and pencil exercise where really people learn more about what does it mean to be successful as a business going forward, what I would call greater business literacy. It encourages different points of view to be heard and builds commitment because we do fashion our shared vision out of what everybody brings to the table. Um, that takes time. It's not a one-hour exercise in front of a flip chart, and it may take several months for people to really own a picture of where we really want to go together. And it does need to be strategic and granular, not just a feel-good statement. Uh, when when, when uh, Dr. Kaplan was talking about the vision at Virginia Mason, and he talked about patients at the top and being a quality leader, it's very few words, but they discussed that for many months, and so there was a shared understanding of what that meant within the organization that goes well beyond the few words that was used to articulate it. And while it means to be a stretch, clearly not what it is we are today, it can't be so much of a stretch that it strikes people as a fantasy. And then I think for people to really own it, they have to believe that leaders, physician leaders and others in the organization will have the commitment and the discipline to hang in there for a number of years to achieve it. And I think, you know, the, the people of Virginia Mason, after 12 years, can see there is a constancy of purpose in that organization that goes from year to year. And that certainly builds commitment. And finally, around shared vision, I think it really is about shared interests. And in many of our organizations that I, that I go into, it seems as if we have very little in the way of shared interests. But as this diagram shows, it's a very simple Venn diagram, as simple as our commitment to our patients, our economic viability, our ability to recruit and retain the best talent doctors and nurses and others, those are all areas where we have a lot of shared commitment. And if we start to think about what's the vision that will help us realize these very basic shared needs, I think it's a great place to start. Finally, talking about now this notion of enhanced leadership, this doctor leader who can sponsor change. Well, I think we all know that in most of our organizations, and long within the tradition of doctors as, as leaders, most doctors would like to see their leaders as advocates and protectors. As it's often been stated, I would like my doctor leader to go out and advocate for us for what we need and then protect us. Protect us from change because then we can do our very best work. We want our doctor leaders to communicate on our behalf and tell people what it is that we need up, you know, up in the higher levels of management and then let us know what, what comes down, what they're thinking. But most and foremost, I think doctors look at their leaders as first among equals, if you will. And as one doctor described it to me early in my consulting career, my leader can go to all the meetings they want, but they are not one millimeter above. There's really no authority invested in that person. And so what I think we often find is the hospital or the organization needs physician leaders who can sponsor change, stand up, hold people to engage them, and then hold people to account. But as we know, physicians don't easily accept the legitimacy of their leader's authority. It's very, very flat, not one millimeter above. And so we have doctor leaders who are really caught in the middle. And that's really an untenable place to be. Um, and so I, I, I think the, the example of Virginia Mason is a great one where they made the job of a physician leader a real job with, with accountability um, and the, uh, the need for metrics to demonstrate that there is improvement going on with a lot of support in education and coaching and training. But I think, I, I, but in, in a more general way, I think we really are up against the culture in most of our organizations and within the profession of what a doctor leader is all about and what their job is. Ed Schein, who many of you may know, is really the, the, the originator of the term organizational culture, a very famous organizational psychologist in the United States. He basically says that when we look at a leader, what's acceptable for him or her to do is really determined by the culture of leadership. And he talks about in his, in his book on leadership and culture, he describes organizations when they're at the stage of really requiring dramatic change and transformation. 
Leadership now is the ability to step outside the culture. Don't take the clues from the previous leaders or the culture of leadership. Step outside the culture that created the leader to start evolutionary change processes that are more adaptive. Looking outside, recreating what it means to be a leader. And I think the story, again, of Virginia Mason gives you a very kind of very clear notion. This was not just a kind of a philosophical shift, but evolutionary change processes moving to appointed leaders that are accountable for producing results. It's a very dramatic, different culture around leadership. It's, it's critical in going forward. And then finally, the Virginia Mason story is a great example of modernizing a compact. And you heard Dr. Kaplan say that they would not have been able to make the progress they made without working doctors and management together to co-create this new sense of what do I give and what do I get, this new deal. This notion of a compact actually comes out of a, of a literature of organizational change going back to the late 60s and early 70s, where the compact is defined as the expectations members of any organization have that are unstated, typically, but commonly understood. And typically, it's like, what do I give and what do I get? In the United States, for many years, up until the mid-1980s, a great example is loyalty for job security. If I'm loyal to the company, I have a job for life. It's that kind of, a, of an understanding, which is mutually beneficial and really helps an organization be successful as long as that compact is relevant. But when you think about the typical physician compact, I think of what was expected to give was to treat patients and be a good doctor as professionally defined, and what they were promised in return by the organization and by society is when you are a professional, autonomy, you do your own thing, protected a lot from change, or the economic concerns, management concerns, and entitlement, whether it's to patients, whether it's to certain kinds of behaviors that wouldn't be tolerated in others, whether it's, whether it's about a parking space closer to the front door, all I think of examples of entitlement. This did build successful organizations for years, um, and, and a lot of health care was provided that was quite good in those times. But here's where I think we stand today, at least in the countries where I've done work. We have this traditional promise or legacy expectations, but we have the imperatives that we've been talking about here for the last couple of days. And I think this is wherever I go, it's pretty much this list that you can see up in front of you. And as I think you can tell by looking at this diagram, it's difficult to make progress on those imperatives when the doctors who need to be engaged and actively really working to address those imperatives come from a place which for years has reinforced this old deal. And I think what we've done in most organizations is not fundamentally renegotiated the deal, but chipped away at it over time. And so I think what many doctors feel in their organizations and from their profession is a lot of alienation because they're left with not the old deal, they're left with the Swiss cheese of the old deal and nothing really left to take its place. And so what you see in the Virginia Mason story is an organization that did the hard work of actually recreating that compact. Well, it sounds perhaps a bit jargony to say the journey of creating the compact is, important as, is as important as the destination. It's true. It's through this process of give and take and negotiation that you come up with something which feels like is something I can live with. There's something about letting go and giving up the things that were embedded in the old compact. It's very difficult. But if we can engage people in creating the new, um, there's something about that process that helps them move through the change and begin to embrace the new way. It does have to be an iterative process. In large, complex organizations, it can take upwards of a year of dialogue, not every day, but so that everybody is brought into the dialogue once or twice. It's through that that you end up with ownership. And there are many stories, Virginia Mason being one of the best examples, of organizations that have done the hard work and have really transformed the relationship with their doctors to give them the capacity to engage them and then to move forward, really, and, and, and building a whole new level of relationship with doctors. Um, and finally, as Gary said, it's mutual accountability. Management accountable to doctors, doctors accountable to, to management. This is not about changing the doctors. It's about everybody changing and all parties being accountable to each other. And finally, just so you see it in the context, if we think about a vision being the, the kind of the determinants of a vision being the things that you see up there on a the screen, that leads us into a strategic vision, this kind of statement that says, this is the direction, this is the picture of where we need to go. And then out of that, we describe a compact. What is it the organization needs from doctors, if we're going to really achieve our vision? And then what is it the doctors need from the organization so that they can fundamentally fulfill those commitments? And what else can the hospital do or the organization do to make it a meaningful place to practice, but not over-promising? 
always recognizing that these are commitments, these are not theoretical ideas. So with all of that, um, at least in, in, uh, in my experience, taking those on, it's not a, a one-day retreat and it's not six months of work, but it's really what we're talking about here is over a period of two to three years, building greater capacity. The world doesn't stop for this work, and in fact, a lot of the work you do can be embedded in, in, in many of the issues that I've described here and the issue illustrated by Virginia Mason. But I think... It's all about engaging your doctors because as this diagram implies, as this picture implies, we don't know what lies around the bend. But it's clear that if we're going to have the kinds of organizations that are flexible and change ready, we need a very different relationship with our doctors, at least in most of our organizations. And what we hope we've shared with you is a, a kind of a, a roadmap and kind of the, the big buckets of work that will help you get there. Uh, I'm gonna ask Gary to join me now and we're gonna take some questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. So if people would come to the microphones, it's hard to see, um, but if there are any souls out there that have questions, ah, great. Please. Ah, great. I see one, one person one, rising. One here, one there. And, okay, I see one person here, please. Um, first of all, I want to share a, a small story given by my grandmother. Uh, because I think it is relevant in this uh, situation. Um, it is a bedtime story, and she told me that there was a king who wants to test the, how reliable his citizens are. So he approaches his cabinet and asks them, how can we test our citizens? So the prime minister comes up with a plan, say that we'll uh, put a tank in the, in the palace, and every citizen will contribute a, a liter of milk. And it is a closed environment. Nobody will see who is putting how much. So they will announce that this is for a prosperity day. We want all the citizens to contribute a liter of milk from every household. So the process starts. One guy thinks, why don't I put some water in it? Because nobody will notice, because there are thousands of liters of milk. And one liter of water is not going to make a change. So the end of the day, the king says how much milk we collected. They find only water. Okay. So I think those who came to this conference who are in, engaged in quality, we are all putting the milk. We are not putting water. But as, um, as far as a physician who traveled different countries to end up in the United States, I can say that I am not after autonomy. I am not after entitlement. And, but the, the autonomy is what I wanted is to do the quality work. If I see a medical assistant recording a blood pressure over the clothes, if I stop that, there is resistance. You know, that type of autonomy is what we want, not okay. the autonomy of something else. Okay, so Gary, I, I'll take a quick shot. Um, I don't know what the situation is in your country or your organization. Okay, I don't know. But I can tell you in my experience, there is still a lot of holding on to professional identity. And this is not a judgment about bad or good. It just is so in my experience. And I have tremendous empathy for doctors in terms of what we're asking them to do. I think it is a rather radical shift in their relationship to organization and to their profession. And so I think this idea of helping people through that transition is what this is about. If that doesn't resonate is so for you, that, then you're in a very different place in your organization or in your country. But it's very resonant yeah. in the places that I go to. Maybe not so much in the younger generation, but certainly in, in, a, in doctors, say, who are, oh, 45 and older, 50 and older for sure. So, but I mean, that, that may just be a variation, but maybe we ought to take another question rather than, please. Thank you. Uh, this question is, uh, first, I'm Saadi Tahir, I'm the medical director of a hospital in Saudi Arabia. It's the flagship of healthcare in Saudi Arabia. And we are at 1,000 beds. Soon we will be 1,500 beds. Uh, and my question is related to stopping the Langeri for the PSA. Uh, it uh, is intriguing to me how that could be achieved in a surgical OR, for example when there are patients and relatives and surgeons 
prima donnas where uh, you, when, when you decide to stop the line and uh, uh, availability of the senior executive to restart the line. Um, obviously, I'm very impressed with what you achieved. I read uh, Charles Kennedy's book about your hospital twice. That's a remarkable achievement. Thank you. So can you explain that? Sure. I think stopping the line is a term that Toyota uses uh, and that we embrace, but it's not a really um, fully accurate description of the patient safety alert system. So what we want to do and, and, and have tried to do at Virginia Mason, and I think we need to do in healthcare, is move from retrospective quality assurance, where a month or two later, we find out things that could have gone better and find out where the systems are broken and fix them, to a real-time quality assurance uh, process where we can identify near misses, we can identify problems before they occur, or we can identify problems that have occurred but prevent them from reoccurring immediately. And so we call it stop the line, and in some situations, we do. So that's part of what the senior leader, and when I say senior executive, I'm not talking about uh, just an administrator coming and telling the doctors uh, stop the line, but physician and nursing leadership saying we need to uh, take this process offline because it is unstable at the present time and we can't understand the root cause and, and put in the, the mistake-proofing improvements without stopping the process. But very few of those 22,000 patient safety alerts actually resulted in a hard stop of a process. Some did, and sometimes we took providers or other staff offline for particular issues as well. I hope that's helpful. Great. I think we have time for one more. Anybody over here? And then we're willing to stick around for a few minutes. Oh, at the end, of you. absolutely. Over here, I think, yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Mark Walker. I'm from Canada. I have read a lot of your work and had Richard Bulber lecture on lean and <clears throat> talk about what you've done. Two questions I have very quickly. One, the, it was the process of the compact, and not the compact itself, that was for both. Yes. Yeah. The second question is, after everybody drank the Kool-Aid, did you have a big turnover? So, um, I'm going to make a quick comment at the end. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first stab at, you know, Jack, I have to say, that Jack Silverson and his partner, Mary Jane Karnacki, really were the individuals that first identified in the social compact literature how to uh, apply this uh, in healthcare. And we were fortunate enough to learn about this. And I think the statement is correct, that our compact's interesting, and many organizations have asked for copies, and you're welcome to it. Um, but what's most important is the deep, deep conversation. Our compact process touched every physician in the organization. And when the compact, physician compact was finished, our leaders said, we want a compact too. All of the people from the CEO to the frontline nursing supervisor, what are our obligations to the organization and what can we expect in return? The reciprocal agreement and a deep process ensued. It, that, that process, those processes were foundational to our ability to move this work forward. And to your last question, um, I, so, some people did leave. Not very many, but it was, it was challenging for me because I grew up in the system. I wanted everybody to come. But uh, I don't think I realized soon enough that not everybody could come. And we said not everybody needs to be a champion, but you cannot be a barrier. It's like the surgical checklist or the uh, s standard set up in the operating room for anesthesia trays. Uh, we can't have an agreement that we're all doing it one way, but one or two people opt out. And so that led to a few people leaving. And today, this work is actually a magnet for attracting others to Virginia Mason. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is just two quick comments. One, 
I mean, I know the, the idea of drinking the Kool-Aid. I, don't, I know you didn't mean anything particular about that. But I think it's not about Kool-Aid. It's really about giving people the opportunity for dialogue where they come to something. So I just I think it's important to really understand that. The other thing, it is true that the process, I think, is as or more important, having done this and helped facilitate this in many organizations. It's as or more important than what's actually written there. But it is important that once you have a vision, thinking about what are the relatively few things that we would like to hold each other accountable before, because because those are the high leverage things that will promote us to get to the vision. So it's not irrelevant, but the process is extremely important. So I think it's both, actually. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll be around at the end. Thank you. Thank you. to add his view on patient engagement. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. <clears throat> I'm Jerry Healy. I'm currently a senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, but let me quickly tell you a little bit about how I got here today. Uh, it's a life's journey. Uh, a life's journey in a profession that's a privilege to serve patients. And I think one of the key cornerstones when we talk about physician engagement or the engagement of anyone who has the privilege of taking care of patients is to constantly remind all of us and all of those that we are trying to influence that it's about the patient. Every single person in this room, you and me, our families, our friends, our coworkers, etc either has been, currently is, or will be a patient. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about how do we engage physicians in this new process of change. It's hard to believe that there should be anything new about taking care of people with illness. But the world is changing. And it's changing in all professions, not just ours, but the professions of law and business, finance, whatever. So I want to chat a little bit with you today about my thoughts about how you can begin a process to influence physicians. I don't want to leave out you nurses or hospital administrators or other health care providers or workers because what I'm going to say to you today, I hope can apply to all of us. Uh, I think we need to change the slides. I have to do that myself? Sorry about that. Let me quickly tell you a little bit about myself and how I've developed some of the thoughts and ideas that I want to share with you today. I started this journey 40 odd years ago as a physician. But life starts a lot sooner than that. It starts with who influenced you? Who, who packed your parachute, as they say, that allowed you to get where you are today? And this journey for me has been an incredibly wonderful one. I've had the privilege of both being a teacher and a learner, a caregiver and one who has sought care. I also had the opportunity to serve as the Surgeon in Chief of a world famous children's hospital, Boston Children's Hospital. I had the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of a Surgical Certifying Board. The privilege of serving as President of the American College of Surgeons. I heard a little chuckling about those surgeons in the OR. And sir, you're right. There are a lot of prima donnas that wander around operating rooms under the title of surgeon. 
And we're going to talk a little bit about how you might help change those people. But what have all these opportunities afforded me? They've afforded me the chance to sort of think about how can we make it better? For it's not about titles. It's not about being the CEO of Virginia Mason or the president of the American College of Surgeons. It's about being a leader for change, for the positive in your family, in your rooms or offices, in your operating theater, in your clinic, in your hospital, in the world. So let's talk about what is there out there in terms of expectation? What do the patients expect? What should we expect of each other? In my opinion, in healthcare, it's very simple. We all should expect competent care rendered in a quality manner, in a safe environment, <clears throat> which is cost efficient. <clears throat> It's fairly simple. <clears throat> but this is an expectation and a shared vision that we should all be striving to achieve together. So I've thought about how we could compact this and what are the three major elements that go to achieving a positive outcome for this shared vision. One is leadership. We'll talk a little bit about my perception of what makes a good leader. You can read many books. Many people have different ideas. I'll share my own with you. Role modeling. I am here today because of role modeling, both positive and negative. Early in my career, I was the victim of negative role modeling. But it was very important for me to look at that person and say, that is not who I want to be. And then, what are you going to leave behind? How will you be remembered? In your family? In your organization? In life? That's your legacy. And this is what I try to impress on junior physicians, senior physicians, all of us who have been given the privilege, underlined, of caring for patients. So what are the challenges that are facing us in the area of rendering safe care, and what are the challenges to role modeling? I suspect almost everyone in this room has had a role model somewhere in life someone who they wanted to follow and be like, or someone that they didn't want to be like. My earliest role model, from the time I could remember, was my maiden aunt, Anna. She lived with us when I was a youngster growing up. She was unmarried, my mother's sister. But I can remember as a little child, this woman getting up every morning traveling on three different buses to her job as a telephone operator. These were the days when women sat in front of giant boards with all types of plugs and connected calls locally and around the world. She never missed work in 44 years. Will she be remembered as the Prime Minister of France or the President of the United States? No, but she made a difference in my life. This was someone who taught me and role modeled me about the importance of a work ethic, about doing your job honorably and with the highest quality that you can think of. Here was my negative role model, Zeus the chief of surgery at a world-famous hospital where I was enrolled to become a cardiac surgeon. He dominated the entire landscape. 
It was about him and nothing else. Not the patient, not the trainees, not his colleagues, not the nurses, him. And whoever had to suffer so that he was happy must be sacrificed. And I vowed, this is not the guy I want to be. And when I told him I was leaving cardiac surgical training, he pointed his finger at me, as you can see his fist coming out at you there, and he said, Healy, you will never amount to anything in American surgery. Get out of my office while you're still living. I never forgot that man. And the night I was inducted as president of the American College of Surgeons, in a room not unlike this, he was sitting in his wheelchair in the front row. And I talked about being the victim of negative role modeling and how that had had a positive influence on my life. And I looked right at this man. And at the reception afterwards, he said, you were talking about me, weren't you? And I said, sir, you were always very perceptive. <laughs> so where are the Zeus's now? Oh, they're still around. They're fading. But they're still around. And if we're not careful, we could be creating a few more that propagate. So these are the issues I think we must address to prevent the reincarnation of Zeus. First, communication. We have stopped talking to patients. The cell phone, the iPod, all of these devices, email, etc., have begun to replace the art of human communication. Patients still want to talk to their doctor. Patients still want you to lay hand on their shoulder and tell them they'll, you will be there for them when that critical moment in their illness is going to get very difficult. That connection with another human is part of the laying on of hands. We are losing this. It's part of communication. We must address it. I'm going to skip professionalism for one second because I'm going to concentrate on an issue there for, for your um, enlightenment a bit, but I want to talk about teamwork. This is not how we, us old gray-haired guys, were trained. You heard in our previous discussions talk about the old model. It was you and the patient. All these other people, the nurses, the healthcare workers on the floor, the nurses' aides, the secretaries, they were all sort of peripheral. That's not the way it is, folks. I don't need to tell all of you gathered here that it's about teamwork. It's about gathering people together around a common goal. Do you remember the triangle that Gary showed? Who was at the top of the triangle? The patient. So today, training young physicians, the so-called junior doctors, about being part of a team that communicates with the patient and acts professionally is critically important. Some of my friends and colleagues were telling me about interactions they have with their orthopedic surgeons, who sometimes are a bit troubling. If these guys aren't careful, they're becoming technical robots. Many of you have the Da Vinci device in your operating room. If you don't have the elements of communication, the concepts of teamwork, and professionalism, you will be replaced by the robot. Because if all you have to offer the patient is the ability to sew a graft into the coronary artery, or to replace some hardware in the left hip, you're a dinosaur. You're finished. It's over for you. You better figure it out quickly. So what about professionalism? What are the elements that are now impeding safe and quality care? 
And why aren't leaders dealing with these issues? Disruptive behavior is a worldwide problem amongst physicians. Anger management, substance abuse, unprofessional conduct. As Don Berwick says, we are in danger of removing professionalism from the profession. How do we know this is in the increase in the U.S.? Well, we hear from risk managers in hospitals and healthcare systems. We hear from physician managers of large group practice organizations, not Virginia Mason, I'm sure, but other organizations. We hear from assist physician assistance programs. I'm currently on the Board of Registration of Medicine in Massachusetts, which is the group that licenses and disciplines physicians. We have a problem, and it's not unique to the United States. Survey of American College of Physician Executives in 2009. 1,700 odd people surveyed. This is what they reported and the percentage of them reporting. Physical abuse, pushing people, throwing instruments, using profanity. You want to be treated like a professional doctor? Act like one. Treat your colleagues with professional conduct. You want respect? Give respect. This is a serious problem, and we, if uh, we pretend or purport to be leaders, must deal with it. Because as a leader, you get what you demonstrate. If you're Zeus, the young people coming after you will be Zeus. What do you tolerate as a leader? If you're the chairman of surgery and you have one of these guys in your department and you constantly look the other way because he's a big provider of care, you are as guilty as that person. And that is how your colleagues view you. You are tolerating bad behavior. And what do you promote in your organization? What is this organization about? Is it about patient-centered care, or is it about the people who work there getting their way when they jump up and down and demonstrate? Because they bring in a lot of patients to our hospital. Or we need them to be on call because no one else wants to do it. This is leadership. You heard, heard about what Virginia Mason did? They didn't command excellence. They built it. They built it in a joint process with total engagement of everybody on the team. Great leaders build excellence. They don't command it. So these are Jerry's seven C's of leadership. First, courage. Not arrogance, courage. Be decisive. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, we could, we could give you chemotherapy. Well, we could give you radiation. Then there's always surgery. Gosh, you know, I'm not sure what the best thing is. Let's call a meeting of the committee to figure this out. Now, I'm not saying make decisions in vacuums. But when you make decisions on good information gathered in the appropriate way, make a decisive decision and stay with it. Endurance and the will to do the right thing and appropriate assertiveness in the organization. Appropriate assertiveness is part of courage. Next, confidence. Confident leaders have self-discipline. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about the last holiday party you went to. How did the CEO act at the party? Could he handle alcohol? Was he mature? Was he going around telling off-color stories to everyone? Oh, I've seen some people like that, haven't you? They're immature, and they don't have a lot of self-confidence. They're constantly needing to be propped up, told how great they are. Creativity, have a vision. 
Let's go outside the organization and try something different. Gee, car company, there's an interesting group. They're doing something innovative. Maybe we could learn something from them. I suggested at my hospital many years ago that we go to Disney and see how do they manage large groups of people who have lots of children who have to wait. You think I was from outer space. Disney? What do they know about health care and hospitals? They know how to manage large groups of children who are fussy, tired, and are waiting in line. Sound like a hospital to you? Yeah. A vision for change, an imagination of how we can be better. Communication. Great leaders listen. Not the great pontificator who stands up and tells 5,000 people in the audience, this is how we're going to do it. No, they listen. Because you might hear something interesting and informative that says, wow, what a great idea. And candor. Oh, don't worry about it, Joe. Uh, we'll make sure this happens. And then it doesn't happen. Versus, Joe, we just can't do that. And here are the five reasons why. I appreciate your concern, but I'm going to be straight with you. A, B, C, D is why we can't do it. Not, don't worry, Joe, we'll take it under advisement and, you know, give Joe a great expectation that things are going to go his way. Great leaders who can communicate effectively don't do that. Caring. Hmm. There's an interesting one. I call it a profound trait. Do you really care about the people you lead? Do you want to know about their families, their trials, their tribulations? Are you a shoulder they can lean on when adversity comes forward? Are you there for them at the most needy and important time? Charisma. Inspire people. Encourage them to be the best they can be. Have a passion. Demonstrate that this is really where we got to go together and I'm going to be part of getting us there. And you're going to be with me all the way. And we have a purpose. The purpose is making life better for the patient. Character. Integrity. Humility. There's a new one for the big shot leaders. Trust. Beliefs. Stand for something. Oh, the world is full of people who don't agree with you. That's fine. We can learn from them. But you need to stand for something. And people need to know what you stand for. And have values. And the last and most important one, honesty. Be an honorable person. How will you be remembered in terms of this one? So the package, leadership, role model, and finally, legacy. And I want to talk to you about my concept of legacy. There's a great poem by a woman named Linda Ellis called The Dash. And I've come to believe that legacy is the dash. The dash is what it's all about. The dash is that line on your grave marker that sits between the date of your birth and the date of your death. And the dash is what you did in between. Most of us do not get an opportunity to change our dash. In the late 1800s, a man sat at his kitchen table 
in southern France reading the morning paper. And there was his obituary. But he was reading his own obituary. And the headline was, The Father of Destruction is Dead. And the story was about how this man's invention had killed and maimed thousands of people all over the world. His name was Alfred Nobel. He was the inventor of dynamite. Nobel, actually his brother had died, but the newspapers made the error in thinking it was him. And so he had an opportunity to change his dash. He lived for 10 more years. And how do we remember him today? Oh, if I push you, you can tell me he invented dynamite. But your first reaction is that he was responsible for the Nobel Prize, given for all the good things that people try to do in the world. He had an opportunity to change his dash. This guy, who did a lot for mankind, Jonas Salk, has a great quote in his background, and that is, our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors. This is your legacy. This is how you, doctor, will be remembered. As Zeus, or as a thoughtful, caring person who tried to make the team caring for the patient better in some small way, and contributed to putting smiles on the faces of lots of patients. The package, as I mentioned, and some lines from the poem by Linda Ellis. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we lived and love and how we spend our dash. So when your eulogy's being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Powerful. Makes you think a little bit about what's this all about? Young doctor, old doctor, What are you leaving behind? Remember Salk, and remember this. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions, or I'm sure we can bring on Jack and Gary back up here. If you guys want to share some of my time, we have Plenty of time to engage questions. Don't be bashful. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you very much for this great presentation. I'm a French student, a pharmacy student with master's degree in risk health assessment and pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacovigilance. I just would like to highlight a poster my manager and a consultant and I have here and which is dealing with some of the items you've just talked about, and especially teamwork, uh, real-time quality, and checklist. Um, you can see this poster in the Medication Heroes area, and feel free to ask any question you could have about this. It was important for us to share this because we encountered some trouble in implementing this checklist with consultants. But even though we had these troubles, this prescribing checklist was useful to reduce prescribing errors in the pediatric unit at Imperial College. Thank you very much. Thank you. Make sure you go see this poster. You mentioned checklist. Could I just talk a second about implementing the checklist. So when I was surgeon in chief at Boston Children's Hospital, the idea of checklist was just coming out. So I decided to engage the, the pilots from United Airlines who run their CRM program to come to our hospital 
and try to teach people about how the airline industry did it, reaching out to another industry who's done it effectively. Um, it actually did help immensely in trying to change the mindset of the surgeon who says, I've been doing this for 30 years, I've never operated on the wrong side, and I don't need this. This isn't for me. So we had a few of those guys. So I decided to try to deal with this one-on-one. -on -one. So I took them out for lunch. It's always important if you're buying, they have to listen. Doctors will do anything for a free lunch. So uh, I take these guys out for lunch and I say, well, Jack, tell me why you're against this. Well, you know, it takes too much time, it's over. I say, yeah, but why are you really against this? Those, those are frankly, frankly lame excuses, it takes too much time, it takes 30 seconds. Well, you know, I say, you know, you can be a change agent here. What do you mean? Well, you're one of the guys that's really against this. Now, for young surgeons, or for you, you only need to operate on the wrong organ once, and your career is ended. You will not be remembered for all the great things you did. You'll be remembered for the fact you took out the wrong kidney, either on the right patient or the wrong patient, whatever. So I need your help to fix this problem. Me? Yeah, you. Why me? Because you, people respect you. They look up to you. The young doctors think you're a great surgeon. And I need help. Well, OK. Um, what do you want me to do? Well, let's go over the checklist. Let's work on this. And you be you know, somebody who's really an agent for change. The idea is, in my opinion, engage the problem people and make them part of the solution. And I found that an incredibly effective methodology for dealing with this. I don't know what you guys think. Meanwhile, more questions, please. Uh, are you, you in agreement about engaging? Well, I, would, I would just say that in all of our organizations, we have formal leaders and we have opinion leaders. And they're not always the same. And in our work, in our journey, which is all about change, from whether from a checklist to changing the processes of, of everyday patient care, uh, we needed to capture the hearts and minds of the opinion leaders. Uh, just, as, just as you identified this surgeon as someone who could really be helpful. And by leveraging uh, that, uh, I think it's really helped us accelerate. Sir, up there. Shams Khan, I'm a doctor at uh, Wigan Infirmary in England. Um, I wanted to ask, or I was wondering if you could take me through uh, a day or even a week in the life of a uh, doctor leader, um, just so I can get an idea of what they actually do, because you mentioned that it was important to have a doctor leader as more of an official job rather than just the title. Should you take that? You want to take that one? Uh, well, I think, first, first of all, when I talk about physician leaders at Virginia Mason, uh, I'm talking about clinicians. I'm talking about people who continue to be active in clinical care. And um, I'm the CEO of this organization, and I continue to see patients as an internist, internal medicine physician. Um, that, I think, is really, um, I'm not saying it's an absolute necessity, but it's an important um, enhancement of one's credibility. When we put in the electronic health record, and it was a little bit uh, what we call clunky, was not working uh, uh, for everyone efficiently, I had to uh, use it as well. And so the ability to identify as a physician leader with the everyday challenges that we all face in trying to deliver patient care has been very helpful. As a physician leader at Virginia Mason, uh, I think we spend part of our time seeing patients and we spend part of our time trying to improve our work. So trying to improve our processes, trying to coach, to mentor, to lead people. And part of that is speaking and articulating to the shared vision. It's uh, keeping in front of people the why. I think that's the big, I think, maybe takeaway. And I'm not gonna, I could talk forever on answering the question. But so many times we ask people to change and we do not explain the why. What is the rationale? How do these dots connect? If we do this a different way, what 
is our hope for outcome, as opposed to we need to implement the change, or we just need to do it. So I think a lot of it, our time is spent in what we call connecting the dots for our, for our physicians and for all of our teams, team members. Yeah, uh, as a chief of surgery, I totally agree with Gary. I spent my week trying to live the life of everyone else in the department. Uh, seeing patients, doing surgery, being in the operating room, uh, but also mentoring. And I would spend special amounts of time with the young doctors, sitting with them in what I used to call chief's rounds, where they could talk about anything they wanted. It was an hour and a half of my time given specifically to them to talk about life, how do you deal with family issues at home, how do you deal with finding a job, how do you deal with this complex medical issue. It was their hour and a half to talk about anything they wanted. That was an opportunity to connect and get a sense of who these people were, uh, what were the things that were troubling them, and how could we together make change. I probably, in my career, learned far more from residents than I taught them. And I think that this is an incredibly valuable experience to have the opportunity to be with young people and, and spend time during the week and not relegate this to the so-called junior doctors because you're too busy as quote unquote the chief. Yeah, you have to go to all these other meetings and so forth, but busy people find time to do these things and they're very important. I would just add one thing quickly. I think there is the tasks that people do but there's also this psychological shift from the advocate to more of the sponsor of organizational change. And it's done in gentle ways and it's done in firm ways, but it does take a tremendous amount of courage, I think, to step out of the old role. Just one other point that I think is important. But when one embraces leadership, as Jerry's described it and Gary's described it and demonstrated it, I think it gives doctors ultimately much more influence in the organization. Because among the other executives in the organization, when doctor leaders can work with their colleagues colleagues and make and keep commitments about change and improvement, I think they have infinitely more influence in the organization overall. I think that's a, a point that's really worth making because why else would doctors be willing to delegate a level of authority to their colleagues other than the fact that I think ultimately they'll get more of what they really want, which is influence. Hi, I'm Ines van der Kemenade from the Netherlands. I worked for several years with medical doctors um, and what I see is that they some of them take the leadership role, but what I've seen happen is that they are very occupied in change and really making, trying to make a difference, but have a problem in involving the rest of the staff. And that's really an issue, that, and I don't know how to, well, could you, could you give me an advice how to bridge that gap? Um, well, for me, the way I um, approach this is by understanding the, the work, understanding the value stream of the work. If you remember my slide that talked about the processes of the, what we call the Virginia Mace production system, value stream was the first. And that's, and when you understand the work, and I used to think I understood my work very well, but it wasn't until actually being observed and the value stream of my work that I came to understand. And when you understand the work, you understand all of the key processes and all of the key people that are critical to accomplishing the work. And when that becomes very visible in the organization, you really can't lead in a vacuum. You can't make decisions without engaging other members of the staff, both physician staff, nursing staff, pharmacy staff, social work staff, all of the people that go into the intersecting value streams in order for the patient to get what they need uh, as they uh, enter and exit the healthcare experience. So I think by making the work visible, it's helped me um, provide a, a vehicle for engaging all of the other uh, critical uh, components of, of making the work happen. It's also helped really make the teamwork um, construct um, an imperative because we can't possibly actually execute uh, effectively with what we would like to see zero defects and optimal efficiency and optimal quality and optimal experience without understanding the work and engaging the people that are part of that work. So that's how I think about it. 
Any other questions? Are we out of time? Just, just, in the, just. I also think it's evidence when people are not engaged that somehow they don't experience it as urgent. And I think just be reflecting back on the importance of urgency, I think sometimes when we feel the pressure and we have that sense of the heat for change, somehow it hasn't penetrated people. So I think oftentimes that's the first place to look. What is it that you know they don't? What is it you experience that somehow they don't? And how do you expose them to that experience so they can come to see it as urgent? Because when people feel it's urgent, they will begin to engage. 